Welcome to Energy Stew. This is Peter Roth, your host. And let's travel again through Navajo country <laughs> into the deepest nature of the Navajos and how they live in ways that we can't imagine. And yet, the author of the book, Spirit Land, The Peyote Diaries of Charles Langley, is actually, he's the guy we're going to talk with, Charles Langley, who wrote this book, and his adventures with the Navajos. And Charles, welcome to Energy Stew. Thank you very much for having me, Peter. Good to I'm talk glad, to you. I'm glad you're back again. We did talk not long ago uh, about so many experiences that you had traveling with what we might call a Navajo shaman. Why wouldn't we call him a, sh a shaman? Well, um, sh the word shaman or shaman is completely meaningless to Navajos. I mean, it, it's not a word I've ever heard any Navajo use ever. Um, they will talk about a medicine man. And yeah. the blue, blue horse in, in, in the book is the, the man I, I'm apprenticed to. Uh, most Navajos would refer to in English as a medicine man, because that's a term that English-speaking people would, would understand. But again, these things, there are layers and layers going on here. That is not the word they use among themselves. This is not the word that they would use in Navajo. And the Navajo language is still very strong on that observation. The wrong word they would use is hatari. And any Navajos listening in, please forgive my pronunciation. <laughs> I'm doing my best, but it's hitali. And that word is usually again translated into English as singer. But again, that's not quite what it means. <laughs> Well, let me, let me see if I can understand that. Singer means that they, they sing along with, with the, the deeper um, energies of life, that they sing in flow and tune with flow in order to be a medicine man. Well, in order to be a medicine man, you have to know a lot of prayers and songs and to perform a ceremony. Uh, you need to know exactly these these uh, prayers and songs. You need, need to be word perfect, uh, and you need to know exactly where to perform in the ceremony and how to perform. And some of these ceremonies, uh, even a short one, can go on for two days. Long ones can go on for five days. I mean, it's an in incredible feat of memory that the uh, the medicine men do. Uh, but the, the, the songs and the chants, really, Hitali is more, is closer to chanter, a man who chants, chants, as you would say in your uh -huh. short, short A American, a chanter. Uh -huh. Now, this is exactly the root word from which we get words like enchantment, enchanter, right? Right. It's closer to that, and it's that the magic is in the words, it's in the songs, it's in the prayers. This is where the magic resides. Could it also be in the tonalities of the way they sing using the Navajo language? Yeah, well, a Navajo uh, language is an incredibly complicated language, I and mean, it's so complicated it was actually used as a code during the Second World War and, and actually for some years afterwards. Um, it's, I can speak from personal knowledge of this. It's incredibly difficult to learn it. I mean, I know a bit of Navajo, but I, I couldn't hold a conversation in Navajo. I can pick out key words, so I, I know what people are talking about usually. And it's also a very tonal language. Like, it's not as tonal as Chinese, but it, it, the way you say something can alter quite dramatically its meaning. Uh, and... Um, it also has clicks in it. Um, it it's a very complicated language, but yes, the, 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 the magic here resides in, in the language. The language and the culture 
you know, grow to express each other. And so it's a very expressive language. It's beautiful language right. to listen to. And, and lately I've been looking at something called reverse speech. And actually, our, even all our languages have hidden uh, ways that uh, sounds and words express themselves that have a deeper meaning. And, and you can actually reverse speech and actually hear words being spoken that have a deeper meaning of what they're actually saying. So I can imagine in Navajo that it's extremely magical. Well, Navajo is a very ancient language. I mean, it's far older than English, uh, for instance. Uh, and uh, I don't want to get too technical here with your, your, with your listeners, but it, it's one of the, what's called the Nadine uh, language groups, which, which, include, which has been traced right back to Siberia in, uh, in uh, Russia, uh -huh. and as far south as Arizona, which is where the, the Navajo uh, but their immediate group is Athabasca, so it's come down from the north of Canada. Oh, uh, the, the, the Navajo has migrated from the north of Canada. We're not sure when, but probably somewhere around the 1200s they started moving south, and they brought this language with them. But the language was very, very ancient then. I mean, it, it may well. well, I mean, I don't think anybody knows, but I mean, these things are going back to the Ice Age. And I hope that they're at least continuing to use it and the children, enough of the children, that there'll be a threat of it because so many people are becoming westernized. Well, that's a, that's a very good point. And there's very good evidence now that the language is under severe threat. Uh, when I first arrived among the Navajos, which is about uh, 15 years ago now, uh, I think something like 70% plus of Navajos spoke Navajo. The latest figures I saw in the Navajo Times, which is the, the Navajo newspapers, is it's down to about 30% now. That's incredible. That's, it, that's in, in only 15 years. Uh, and uh, down in the schools, in, in, the, in the kindergartens, in the, in the infant schools, where it really counts, is practically zero. Well, I think what really counts is at home with the parents. and. Yeah speak with each other, they'll develop the sounds and tonality that, you know, the clicks and all yeah. of the, you know, the complexities of it, because children's minds are, are the most pliable to learn languages with. The problem is that, um, unfortunately, like a lot of minority people, not all of them, but uh, it's certainly true among uh, American Indians, the parents have got this idea into their head that children will do better if they only speak English. Uh, I would say that's not true. And no, uh, you can point speak bilingual. You can, absolutely. You can point to goodness knows how many communities all around the world where, where this, this doesn't happen. And people treasure the, you know, the incredible uh, cultural riches you, you can mine from your, your own culture and language. Right. Uh, small nations all around the world. But the Navajo, uh, Navajo parents have, unfortunately very much got this idea in their heads and i believe you know the tribe is making efforts but they don't seem to be too successful well i think you maybe if your book can become more popular among them because it's about them that they can uh, you know have more consciousness about this well um the things i write about the the, the medicine man and, and the um the culture that goes with that is actually still fairly widespread. Um, you know, uh, we deal with young people as well as older people. When dealing with young people, very often now it has to be done in English. Uh, and even when I first arrived, even when dealing with younger people, the medicine men would deal in, in the Navajo language. Now it's more and more being English for young people. Well, the biggest issue really is the continuity of these medicine men mm -hmm. and who's training who, and they're getting old, and yeah. and you're and the, and the, the uh, medicine man who you apprenticed to, Blue Horse, is pretty old himself, right? Yeah, I mean he's well, neither he nor anybody else is quite sure how old he is. Um, the last time he said he was 76. 
<laughs> which would seem to be about right. Uh, but he doesn't actually know when he was born. Not many medicine men are very young. Yeah, and that's the problem. And this so, is a big problem, yeah. So we don't know where our world is headed to in terms of these great cultures that do need to, you know, be healthier in terms of, of living on the land more mm. successfully because there's so much they don't have available to them as they might have had 500 years ago. Well, it's different things. Uh, I mean, I would say that up until really now, the culture and the language have weathered it all pretty well. Uh, but there seems to be a, a very definite downturn coming on now. I mean, look, they, they do, the tribe has done things like it, it's dubbed Star Wars into Navajo, <laughs> okay, <laughs> which, which is great. I mean, I'm all for it. But if, if the kids don't speak Navajo, what's the point, you know? Um, it might encourage them. <laughs> well, you would hope it would encourage them, yes. I mean, it's the start. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm all for things like this. I think it's great fun. Um, but, you know, with, without a sense of mission, if you like, but without a sense of determination to pass along this very essence of being Navajo, which is the language plus the culture, it will very quickly go, but it, it doesn't have to. And I, I often talk to the uh, point to the example of Wales within the United Kingdom. Now, I don't know, many of your listeners may not know, there are actually four or five languages spoken within the British Isles. English is only one of them. Another one is Welsh. Uh, now, Welsh has been <laughs> under pressure, really, from foreign languages and foreign culture for ever since the Romans came to Britain 2,000 years ago. And they're still in their slugging. They're still speaking Welsh. They're still practicing Welsh culture. Uh, and in fact, so successfully that I, I understand there are more people speaking Welsh now than we've been in about the last 150 years. I mean, it's made a very strong country. That's great. Because, um, you know, Welsh kids, well, actually it's Welsh punk kids as much as anything. And the punk band started, what can we do to separate ourselves from everyone else? I know, we'll speak Welsh. So in order to be a Welsh kid and really be with it, you suddenly had to speak Welsh, and they did. Well, uh, I, and, 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 and is, is Welsh associated with any other language that you know of? Well, it's a Celtic language, uh, Irish, um, uh, the... Uh, Irish Cornish, which is a language that's been virtually dead for a hundred years, but now it's coming back. Wow. Scottish Gaelic. The, these are all uh, Celtic languages, uh, and also you find Celtic being spoken in uh, in Brittany, in in, in France. Uh, so these are all interconnected Great. languages. I'm excited that people are allowing themselves to become multilingual, and. I see that in New York. I see a lot of people. I, I know one family, their nine-year-old daughter speaks three languages. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the time to do it. I mean, uh, children can absorb these things. By the time they get to 12, then there's a part, I'm not expert in this area, but I know there's a part of a child's brain that allows it to learn these things very easily. Once they get to about 12, it starts to turn off. And so, you know, in in, in England, when I was at school, they didn't start teaching you languages until you were in the sort of second form uh, of senior school, which meant you were about 12 or 13. Well, really, it's too late. For what yeah, that, well, if you're totally immersed in it, maybe you're, you have enough left. Yeah, 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 that's right. But I mean, it needs to start, like all the, I mean, look, languages start at home. You know, I didn't teach my children English any more than you did. <laughs> they, right. they just pick it up and it's the same for Navajo people it's the same for Welsh people it's the same for any people well my, my younger son language. we put my younger son in a, a dual language immersion yeah. program at school that every other day they they spoke entirely in Spanish and they taught in Spanish and he was in that for about four years and I kept on saying what did, what did you learn today and he said, oh, today I didn't learn anything because it was in Spanish. 
And it turned out that after four years, he really didn't know any Spanish. <laughs> yeah. It didn't yeah. work for him. Other kids, it might have worked for. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I guess we're all unique. My brother is a linguist and speaks yeah. many languages. So uh, there is some there's some genes in the family that that um, some kids might have. But uh, coming back to the Navajo, I'm excited about how long. You, how how many years you spent traveling, uh, you know, con continually, not continuously, with uh, Blue Horse, and watching magic happen in ways that you really weren't prepared to understand until you could see it for real, to to yeah. see the results that magic created, because otherwise. You, you, you know, it's the, I think it's the continuity of the experience that led you to really trust it. Yeah, I mean, look, I hesitate, I, I, I know I said it before, but I hesitate to use the word magic in the sense that, you know, people would generally think of it, you know, sort of Harry Potterishly waving wands around or something like that. But it seemed that way, and yet the results were there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, there's a lot of things that even now I, I can't really explain. Uh, and I'm very honest in, in my books and say, look, folks, I really don't understand how this happened. But this is what I saw. Uh, and I've seen some quite extraordinary things. Um, I, I've seen uh, one of the things we have to do is go around and and there's a lot of cursing on the reservation. There's a lot of witchcraft, a lot of Navajo witches. Uh, and they will curse people. Uh, and these curses are physical objects. And they're not a form of words. And, and one of the medicine man's jobs is to find them. And I have been with Blue Horse when he's found these things in the most inaccessible places. Some of them have been there for years. And the way he does this, he divines in the fire. And one of my jobs as his apprentice is I bring in these red hot charcoals. And he looks into the charcoal and he will see where these things are. And I mean, I see pretty well in the charcoal as well. And I can see a lot of this stuff, but I don't really understand it as well as he does. And he will go off and find these things. And that's right there. That's so yeah. important because here there's charcoal burning giving off images that you've learned to see in the charcoal that point to different uh, natural elements around the, the, the area that you're seeking these curses. And it, it'll actually point physically to whether the curse is up a tree or buried in a yes. hole or behind yes. a bush. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, when you, I mean, look, you know, I know a lot of people find this very difficult to, to believe, so you just have to take my word for it. But once you get your eye in, it's extraordinary what you see in there, and, and it's very clear. It's not like, you know, squint, stand on your head, pretend hard, and you can see something. Often it's as clear as daylight, uh, and sometimes um, faces will appear in the fire. Very, very clear. And um, if you ask the people who've been cursed, I mean, he often will call them over and say, can you see that face? And they'll say, yes. <laughs> yeah, do you know who that is? And they'll say, yeah. <laughs> that's a guy I work with. Or, that, now, what, what does that mean? I worked with two, 10 years ago, you know? What does that mean that charcoal will show you a face? That's in itself says something about nature that's beyond most people's any, any sort of... Yeah. Well, I mean, the idea is very basic, and it's basic to to a lot of kind of shamanism, as we would say in English, and that the world's a chaotic place. So if you have another layer of chaos, like a shovel full of hot charcoal, the chaos on the chaos will produce order. Uh, and there's a way of uh, arranging this charcoal, which is another one of my jobs as, as the apprentice. And I arranged it into a five-pointed star, which actually represents a map. 
uh, and uh, then uh, he will place a crystal at the head of this and he looks through this crystal and, and sees things and it, it's not just where a curse may be hidden it's not just a face that may appear um, he will often look at things that have happened in the past and he'll say to somebody did this ever happen to you um, and again I mean I always feel you know, with my education and background as a, as a journalist and, and an investigative journalist, I always feel slightly um, intimidated talking about this because it, I don't want people to think there's something weird about me, you know. I've tried to do my best as a journalist to say, look, this is what happened. I can't necessarily explain it, but this is what I saw. I was there, I took part in it. This is real folks, even if I can't tell you how it works. But even more so, the reason for all of this happening is to solve people's problems. Yes, yes, indeed. And, and, and very often it does. Um, Including medical problems. Well, the, yeah, I mean, the, this is, is quite common. People will come with these sort of terrible aches and pains and, and they'll say, well, look, you know, I, I, I go to the hospital and all they do is give me pills and the pills don't work and they take x-rays and they can't find anything and, you know, help. Uh, and he will uh, do the divination ceremony. Um, quite often he'll say, well, look, you know, you've been witched. And um, the witch men, Again, you know, you're going to just have to take this at face value. The witch men have a way of uh, infecting people. Uh, and they will literally fire things into your body. You can't see it, you can't feel it, but they do. And he will take a tube. I don't know if you can see me on the, on the video, but it's about this long. It's about six or eight inches long. And he will put it to the affected part and suck on it. And it brings out all sorts of stuff the Navajo called bad stuff. And, and you've seen this and actually turned out are physical objects, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, um, I know, you know, and I'm sure most of your listeners know, you can't suck things out through people's skin without leaving a mark. Uh, and I find this very problematic, but there's no doubt about it. Uh, the patients feel a lot better for it. Right. And, it, and in fact, on one occasion, I, I had this myself. I had this excruciating pain in my shoulder. I mean, it was so bad, I thought, I said to my wife, look, if this gets any worse, you're going to have to take me to the hospital. But what the heck's going on? And the next time I was down um, with Blue Horse, he said, let me have a look at it. And he said, look, you've been shot by a ghost arrow. And he sucked on this tube and he pulled out tiny tiny little stone arrowhead uh how was that done i don't know but what i can tell you is for the next three days it felt as if i got an open wound on my shoulder i mean i could feel it there's nothing there but i could feel it on the and he told me so in four days it'll be fine and the fourth day um i woke up couldn't feel anything my shoulder was completely cured, and it's never hurt since. <laughs> wow. That's all I can tell you. How it's done, I think that's between him and the, and the spirits. But uh, it certainly worked in my case, and it's worked that, in many other people's cases. What that says to me, you know, we're using the Navajos, we're using medicine men as a deeper understanding of reality. Yeah, I, I. I Yes, I mean, I think that's absolutely spot on. Uh, the Navajo mental world, at least in, of you know, people like the medicine men, is not even remotely like ours. It's a completely different universe. I mean, it's not even the same stars in the sky. Wow, well, that's interesting. But what, what I understand from this, you know, is that we all are living in, uh, let's say, a magical universe based on our consciousness. And the Navajo, their consciousness is unique. 
and and so they can identify things and and this is a great perspective to have mm -hmm. their their culture versus ours it's not that ours is less magical because i believe everything is in divine order and working on on very intrinsic ways that we don't understand but that with the navajo you, you can identify it a lot easier yeah i mean it's certainly a lot more to the to the fore i mean very few navajos that i know of th there are very few who don't believe in the power of, of the medicine men. there are very few who don't believe in the power of witchcraft and and most of those people believe in the power of the medicine man to overcome the evil of witchcraft. Yeah. yeah. And yet, for instance, the witches can't really harm you directly so easily because you're not of that culture. So that culture itself has its own reality that an outsider can't partake of and even be vulnerable to. Well, um, that's Except for the arrow coming out of your shoulder. <laughs> well, yes, I mean, uh, this is uh, this is partly I'm unconsciously touching now where it was. Um, this is partly true. Um, they say it's very difficult to witch a white man. Uh, but in my case, this is no longer true because I've now entered Navajo culture so deeply that I've wow. lost any protection that I might have had. Wow. Uh, so you, have to be, you have to tread carefully. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the, 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 and I, I mean, this serious. I mean, there are definitely people who are out to get me, uh, which wise. Um, yeah, because you're you know, a white guy. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah, know. yeah. I mean, and, and there have been more than one attempt, yeah, to really seriously witch me. But uh, fortunately, right. With the good offices of Blue Horse, I've so far uh, escaped escaped their tangled webs. <laughs> well, we're getting near the end of the show, and I'm glad you've escaped so you could be on the show with us. <laughs> Thank you. And hopefully we can talk again uh, in the future. Uh, this is so wonderful to speak about these very complex, uh, profound issues that have to do with examining uh, such an unusual culture and and your book is spirit land the peyote diaries of charles langley you're charles langley uh, can you direct people to a, a website or to a something uh yes uh i mean first of all uh you can get the books on amazon if you put my name in charles langley or spirit land uh it will come up uh we also have um we also have a website, um, the, the spiritdiaries.com. Okay, the spiritdiaries.com. Yeah, and also uh, spiritlandbooks at gmail.com. <clears throat> That's spiritlandbooks at gmail.com. Wonderful. Charles Lang, <laughs> thank you so much for being a guest again on Energy Stew. And, and this is uh, Peter Roth, your host of Energy Stew at PRN.FM. I can be reached at Peter at Heart River, H E A R T River.org, or 212-222-7748. I'd love to hear from you, and thanks so much for listening.